Hello, I'm George Schlackig, the one and only, telling you about a bicycle tour across Central America I did a few years ago. I have a lot of pictures to show you throughout and will try to illustrate the situations I couldn't capture at the time. I was a bit anxious about leaving Belize and crossing into Guatemala because I had heard a lot of mixed stories about that country. The day I did was almost overwhelming. Of course, it was my own fault for having spent almost half a day admiring the ruins of Xunantunich. Was I subconsciously procrastinating the border crossing? For one thing, I had no idea what would expect me in Guatemala. I didn't even have a map, nor any idea what the roads would be like, and if there was any place to stay close to the border. It was nice to meet Jackie and Julio, two other cyclists who had been on the road for a while and were able to tell me a few things. In the end, their information wasn't really that helpful, however, as their estimation of distances had been way off. From the ruins, it was only a few more kilometers to Benque Viejo and then the border. Crossing into Guatemala was surprisingly quick and easy. It cost 20 quetzal. It turned out that was not a lot of money when converted to Canadian dollars, probably around four. Belize charged a departure tax of 37.50 in Belize dollars, which was a bit more. I had no problem finding an ATM on the Guatemala side in the town of Melchor de Mencos. A map, however, was a different story. There just wasn't any store that had one. In the end, I managed to secure a map someone had printed off the internet for me. The whole ordeal took more time than expected, and when I finally left town, I was under the impression that it was only gonna be 10 or 15 kilometers to the hostel Julio and Jackie had mentioned. To be honest, I had no clue what 15 kilometers in Guatemala would seem like and no odometer on my bike. I just didn't really care about distance, but sometimes caught myself looking for some kind of marker at the side of the road. The weather was good and so was the ride. At some point, the perfectly smooth paved road turned to gravel. The real problem was that the point I was hoping to reach was actually over 60 kilometers away from the border, which meant there was no way I could reach it before dark. I gradually found that out by talking to people at the roadside stores I stopped at for cold drinks and watching the sun travel its usual course throughout the afternoon. I hadn't even paid attention to what time it was until it was certain I'd run out of daylight. <laughs> that sure wasn't planned and it actually kind of terrified me. Last resort was asking people if they knew of any accommodation nearby. Yes, I had a tent. I just wanted to be sure that wherever I set it up was safe. In the end, someone walked me to a friend's house that had a spare bedroom to rent out. The equivalent of $8 was all they asked. This seemed like a perfect deal in my situation and I took it. My hosts were a family of four who were very kind and provided me with breakfast the next morning. The room was quiet and comfortable. The bathroom was in the backyard and not quite finished. There was no running water, but a shower from a big barrel of water. I learned a lot from my conversations with Pablo and Julia. Guatemala was beautiful, they said. I was almost sure to fall in love with it, but they also warned me to be really careful about who to trust. Too many officials, including police officers, were corrupt and the government wasn't really in control of the country. 
as a visitor, exploring the country by bicycle, it only meant that I had to pay attention to my surroundings and not do anything stupid. The same stuff to keep in mind anywhere you go, even back home in Canada. It was January 24th and I continued my way toward the lake, Lago Peten Itza, from where I could take route PET 13 to the Tikal National Park, one of the world's biggest Mayan heritage sites located in the region of Peten. After enjoying a delicious meal at a family-run roadside restaurant, I rode the bike all the way up to Tikal without stops. I was determined to see some ancient ruins right away, just like I had done in Zunantunich. There were a few obstacles, however. First, I had to wait until 4 p.m. because this would qualify me for an overnight stay on a single day ticket. Then, there were 17 more kilometers inside the park to reach the archaeological area. It rained the whole way and while it wasn't cold, I, I was soaked once I got there. Thankfully, camping spots were available that had a roof over a concrete pad. But the rest of the day went for figuring out how to set up my tent on the concrete floor. One of the biggest disadvantages of the little tent I had was that it relied on the pegs to keep it up. On the concrete floor, they were of course useless. It was only the next day that I finally got to visit the ruins. They were truly impressive. But what was even more amazing was how the jungle had grown all around the ancient cities, basically taking it back after the Mayans had abandoned it centuries ago. Tikal is mind-boggling due to the number of ruins and the large area they occupy. The temples are as tall as in Lamanai or Zunantunich, but there are many more. Put Tikal on your bucket list if you're intrigued by Native American cultures. <laughs> of course, it started raining again as soon as I was back on my bike. I had been able to purchase a cheap poncho at one of the tourist shops. Rain was apparently common here and made for great vegetation. For a good part of the way it was just drizzle, but closer to Santa Elena, the next major town, it started pouring. Once in the town I wasn't very picky about where to stay and found an old rundown hotel for very little money. The ambience was almost creepy there and I couldn't be sure how secure this place was, but it was a treat just to get out of the rain. I only left the place for a short while to eat supper and went to sleep early. The hotel had a late checkout time and it was pretty quiet in the morning. I decided to visit an internet cafe before checking out as I was publishing a simple blog on Facebook that consisted mostly of pictures. Another reason to go online was to find out more about the road ahead as the printed map I had wasn't exactly rich with details. After checking out, I took a spin through Flores and really liked the town. I even met a mother and daughter who were visiting from Ontario and told me about the hostel they stayed at and how awesome Flores was. There were boat tours to small islands and nearby beaches. I considered staying another day and perhaps a stay at a hostel near the lake, but the weather seemed perfect for riding. I had finally found a better map of Guatemala too, which gave me confidence about the 65 kilometer trip to the next town, Sayache. It was a good day and I was finally getting a feel about the real Guatemala. <laughs> it was beautiful. People here seem to have the basics and not much more, but smiles were everywhere. Apparently, it doesn't take a lot of materialistic goods to bring about happiness. The weather stayed good most of the way, but it rained again toward the end. 
There's one spot somebody warned me about. Apparently the main road was closed because of an assassination. <laughs> of course, it made me question if I had understood correctly and freak out a bit about how secure this place actually was. Whatever had happened though must have been last week's news because I had no trouble passing on a secondary bridge. Perhaps the advisory was more important for people in vehicles as the bridge was kind of narrow, but there was no traffic to speak of. The traffic became apparent only once I reached the Rio de la Pasión. They never built a bridge across the river here. The only free way across was a rickety old ferry. It was going back and forth, overloaded with cars and trucks. Thankfully, with my bike, I was allowed to bypass the lineup of traffic that had built at the dock. The ferry was powered by four little outboard motors that had little roofs over them. Once in town, it didn't take me long to find a really inexpensive hostel. This definitely wasn't a touristy place, as there seemed to be only locals here. Thankfully, I didn't seem too much out of place and no one really paid attention to me. I parked the bike in my room and went for supper and a walk until it was too dark and wet outside. I was grateful for the dry room, but the place was busy and anything but quiet. No problem when you're tired from riding. The next day was January 27th. The ride went on in sunny weather with ditches and rivers still full from the most recent rainfalls. It was interesting to say the least. I witnessed women and children bathing and doing laundry in those ditches and rivers. They were having a good time and weren't too worried about showing off their nude bodies. It also turned out that all the kids in rural Guatemala knew me as Gringo. I remember one small child running across the front yard of a house along the road just to say Hola Gringo with a big smile. At the end of the day I had covered about 95 kilometers and was in a village named Rakruja. It had been a long ride through the beautiful country, also with some serious hills along the way. Just before reaching the village, I bought some fresh coconut from a lady who told me where to find an economical hotel. There was a fork in the road and to get to Rajruja, where the hotel was, I had to go another five kilometers, which was out of my way. The village, however, was definitely worth visiting. I had fun visiting the grocery store to get some snacks and finding a really good restaurant that had a great special of the day. Guatemala, so far, had proven to be the most affordable country I had visited. The people were friendly and for the most part ignored me. My goal was to reach Chisek, another town less than 30 kilometers away a day later and then take an extra day there to rest. Then I would go to Coban the day after, which was 75 kilometers. I had my doubt about this route because someone had already advised me against it. My bike was heavily loaded and there were mountains to climb. I thought I had seen it all before, but the further I got, the more doubts I was starting to have. There were alternate ways across Guatemala, but on my map they looked very underdeveloped and I wasn't sure about what to expect in terms of road conditions. So far, the road had not been a problem, but after Rajruja, the hills were becoming steeper and more frequent. I reached Chisek the following day after a slow start. The ride was much tougher than expected, however. There were some steep climbs, though they were mostly short. Toward the end I had an awesome descent and probably broke the speed limit with my heavily loaded bike. I needed an extra day of rest and was wondering if that would even cut it. 
I found a hotel right on the main drag and took a room for two nights. Since the hotel also had a restaurant, I didn't really venture out too far that night, but made plans to check out the entire town the next day. I did exactly that and it was definitely worth it. The funny thing about small town Central America is how busy it can be. There were big crowds at the market and definitely just wandering the streets was interesting enough to keep me from getting a lot of rest. The other thing I did that day was a bit of bicycle maintenance. The chain needed to be lubricated badly as it had been covered with dust, washed off by the rain and covered with more dust again. The elevation of Coban is 1,320 meters or 4,330 feet above sea level. The town of Chizeg is just in the foothills, a mere 230 meters elevation. Up to this point I had not really encountered serious long climbs on this trip. I felt confident about my freshly cleaned and lubricated bike, but was I gonna make it all the way to Koban with this kind of increase in elevation? I spent a considerable amount of time staring at my map, which was clearly deficient in many areas. Koban was a major city and also a famous coffee growing region, popular with tourists. So the roads going there all looked like they were pretty safe to take, except for the many curves. There were alternate routes in lower elevations, but there was no way of getting any detail about him. I was simply going to stick to my plan and make it up to Koban, regardless of how much climbing I had to do. Worst case scenario, I could always decide to turn around for a quick descent back to Chisek. I set my alarm for early the next day, so I'd be halfway up the mountains by the time the midday heat would hit. I had bought some food to eat in my room before leaving and I'd just stop at the market for a quick coffee and perhaps a snack on my way out. Chisek was in a valley and it was very foggy early in the morning. I'll never forget what it looked like riding down the main drag, passing people on their way to work. This was the Central America I had come to see, far away from any tourist attractions. I had over a thousand meters of climbing ahead of me that day on my home-built touring bike loaded with 60 pounds of stuff. There were moments when the hills became too steep to handle and I had to push the bike. Thanks to my good brakes, I was at least able to do that without rolling backwards. It turned out to be a very tough, long day. I'll tell you more about it next week, so please tune in for my next episode. Was I going to make it to Koban or not? What were the alternatives once I was up halfway on the winding road? For the answers to these questions and how my tour continued, make sure you're subscribed and get notified when I post that video next weekend. In the meantime, I'd like you to explore some of my other content. There are some suggestions for you right here. And I'll see you soon.